I'm here today with Kayvana or KP Parker. <laughs> Hi, Kayvana. How are you today? It's so great I'm to see you. Great. Thank you for having me, Lori. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. So we met at the CIST conference. And was that your first time? No, no. I love CIST. I've been rocking with them for a little bit now. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. It was my first time and certainly not my last. So. I have it on the calendar for next year. It is really well done. Really amazing. Shout out to the CIS team. And you call yourself an unboring sales specialist. And I know that you're involved in enablement and training and onboarding. Tell us a little bit about, about what you most like to do. What I most like to do is to create safe environments for newbies or newcomers that are transitioning into tech sales. I feel like we don't prepare a lot of the newcomers enough. So they come in with either they're really excited and they have no idea what to expect or they're really anxious and they're scared. So when people have like their first week or two with me and then they just, I feel like either the balloon deflate and they get back to normal and they feel good. That is the most exciting piece for me right now. Yeah, that's great. We were talking just a little bit before we started recording just about how we want people, we say to people, bring your whole self to work. And maybe we're at the leadership level at this point. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I've heard people say, I can't bring my whole self to work anymore. Yeah, the premise on boring, I was dubbed on boring when I was working at Yelp and I was doing training there at Yelp. And I've evolved that definition to be able to unmask, to not define standard as key, to come in and uh, bring your full self. And if I'm working with majority of SDRs, BDRs, account executives, they don't feel safe to show up as themselves, especially because they're quota carrying. So they're wondering whether or not they're going to hit their goals. And if they don't hit their goals, a lot of the times leadership is asking the questions about them. What's going on in your personal life or there's things I should know? Who, who are you? As opposed to, hey, what training can we provide for you? And really looking into the trainings. Leadership has that privilege. They can come in and do what they want, show up as they want. But we have to create that same comfort zone and comfort level for our reps. And just because they don't hit quota doesn't mean that their person is in question. Yeah, and I think I, I saw that change when the economy changed maybe a year and a half ago, when, especially in tech, when, when tech layoffs started happening, it, it suddenly became, hey, you're lucky to have this job. If you don't like it, mm -hmm. you can leave. And that was so different from the previous era, if you will, of, hey, this is great. We're going to embrace inclusion and everybody's going to be happy. And it's very different now. And I know there are a lot of people looking for roles or maybe looking for better roles. And if they're in tech and they're women, I, I still hear from a lot of people who have women who have challenges in kind of a boys club environment. Yeah, that's the st story of my life. <laughs> I, I went from driving trucks. I was the only female driving out of Carteret, New Jersey into New York City. I was, it was me and one other female and doing industrial supplies at Granger. So I, I've been in the boys club for years. So wow. I totally understand. And then to your point, post-COVID or around COVID, especially women, mothers, caregivers, they felt, I feel like a little bit of relief where there was a bit of understanding that if you saw my child running across the screen, you understood because we're all from home. Or if I had to put on my calendar a, a break, because I'm also a doula, like breastfeeding or just alone time, mom time, they understood. But then as the go back to office or not even during COVID, the understanding of caretakers. And they're like, we have to prioritize or this theme of like work-life balance came into to the mix even more. All these things. So it's a great point. Yeah. And women are still the predominant caregivers in homes, in life it, with it, not just kids, but also parents, yeah. grandparents. It's a big, it's a big ongoing issue. And I find now that there seems to be like two paths. You can be all virtual or you can be a, a hybrid worker. And, and there are many companies that are embracing totally virtual. We never have to see you in the office. We don't even have an office. 
in a lot of cases. And then there are the companies that are like, you know what, we need you here two or three. And for people that had moved away or what have you, it's there's some people going through some of those challenges now. So would do you have any thoughts about that? Do you have to decide to be hybrid or decide to be virtual? Yeah. Personally, for me, I have a four. Oh, she's five now. Yeah, she's five. Lord. Uh, I have a five-year-old and I, I cannot go back into the office. If any, anyone's mothers or, with children, the public school system, especially in New York, does not work well with the corporate life. It does not work well at all. I drop my daughter off the school at 925 and I pick her up at 325. If I was working in the office, I would have to leave my house at 7, 730 um, and then I'll be back by six. So there's no way I'm, I'm, I'm going back into the office, quite frankly. And I'm very upfront with anyone that I'm working with as to say, hey, you're going to see two blocks of time on my calendar, one from 9 to 9.30 and then one from 3 to 3.30. And that, that's just, it is what it is. Yeah, I get work done, but that's what it got to be. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that's good. And that is one thing that was accelerated because of COVID was the fact that everybody in sales was expected to be in person. And if you were a field rep, you're traveling, obviously, but but five days a week in the office. And so that has been, it's been nice to see for me, have been, having been in sales for many years, it's wonderful to know that if I can reach buyers and I can help them and I can solve their problems and I can do it virtually, hey, more power to me, right? Yeah. And then have the option. When I was, when I first transitioned uh, from when I had my daughter, I had my daughter September before COVID. So she was about six months ah. when the lockdown happened. And then we did like a hybrid thing when we first started. And it was like I was working remotely, but I still did in-person meetups when necessary. Yeah. So if I had to close someone or if someone really wanted to have that connection, it's okay, great. I can get someone to watch my daughter for a couple of hours, go to this lunch or this happy hour or whatever, and then and come back. So having that flexibility works. And some people are just like, no, I want to separate home from work. I prefer to go into the office. If you have the support, if you can afford the childcare, and you want to have that separation, that's totally fine too. Yeah. And I respect it. Whatever works for you, right? So I'm curious, how did you first get into sales? How did you know what B2B sales is? Did you have someone in your family that was in it or what's the story? You were driving a truck, right? After yeah, school. listen, I have a military in my family. When I was in college, I wanted to join the Air Force. I wanted to be a pilot. So I told my college advisor at the time that I was going to the military and she was like, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You're not joining the military. No way. She said, go to this college fair, just go. And I said, whatever. At the time, a lot of my friends called me Coco K because I'm chocolate and brown skin. And Nestle was one of the companies at the college fair. So I was like, ah, for kicks and giggles, let me just go up to Nestle. Went up to Nestle and they basically offered me the role on the spot. They had a leadership development program where you would travel the country. I worked in about... 10 different cities across the U.S., leadership, training, truck, driving in different industries. And that, that was my introduction into sales. So I was packing out haagen DiGiorno, Edie, Skinny Cow, like out of the back of trucks in person. 5'2", by the way. And that was one of the hardest, if not the most challenging role that I've had to date. And I was, again, 20-something, managing 50, 60-year-old drug drivers who had been driving for 30-something years. And the respect and the earning the right to have conversations and the idea of it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter what your title is, like we're all going for the same goals, the same result. I was grateful in hindsight now to have had those learnings really on in my career because as I move on to different industries, especially now into tech, Creating environments that are safe for everyone is very important to me because I didn't have that safety and I didn't get it until I started working directly with my reps. And if my reps could create safety for me as a leader and my leadership didn't necessarily always create that safety, I just realized the importance of it as a leader to then have that 
be mutual and be reciprocated on both ends. So anyway, that's my get into text, get into sell story. It wasn't planned. Just like really blessed with that opportunity. Wow. And then how'd you get to Yelp and tech? Yeah, I feel like my story. So one of the quotes I always give at the end of all of my workshops is just because the road is less traveled doesn't mean it can't get you to the same destination. And my road is the one that's less traveled. And and I just encourage everyone to find their own path, right? For me, I positioned myself in roles that didn't exist yet. So I was working at Nestle, working at Granger. Then I got off that. I wanted to start my own music business. I went to school for music. And I started my own music business. That didn't work. I was doing Century 21, say, like security and sales. It was random. And then I said, I want to get back into tech. I miss selling. And I wrote this fire cover letter for Yelp. And I always say this because people have these like, after 15 years in the industry, I blah, 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 blah. blah. And my cover letter was fire. It was just like, I named all the competitors of Yelp, Slides, all these things. And I was like, I'm a New Yorker. We die hard for restaurants. Hire me and I'll show you like when I got type of thing. And it got me in. Wow. I showed my personality. I showed who I was. I imagine that as they read this, they were probably laughing their butts off because it was very silly. And when you're phone sales, you got to have that personality. You have to show that it can translate outside of in-person context. And yeah, I got the, that's how I, I got into tech sales or as my first SDR and then worked my way up from there. Work your way up. That's great. Yeah. And today I encourage people to get introductions that where you can verbalize that fire letter because it's so easy to get screened out. And I know people that try and try and try. And with introductions, it's the fast path if you can do it. Yeah, I, I, I have, I can, I'm happy to share with you and your community. I have a PDF guide that I built out because I get a lot of DMs about um, transferring from one industry to the next. And it's around the power of voice notes. Um, not all the times can you use video messaging. So I love me a good voice note. I walk around, I pace, I smile, I laugh while I do it. So you can feel energy from me. And in 40 seconds, someone can feel something and it's almost palpable. And they just, they want to respond. Like my conversion rate is like 95% for response rate. And if I send someone a voice note, um, they're like excited to respond back. And with your point of getting inside the door or getting a uh, connection, it's, if that person can feel something from you and you say, hey, would you mind connecting me with the hiring manager or even referring me if it's a win, if you get an incentive for referring someone, I get hired. Um, you can build a relationship that's true, not super transactional, but because they can sense and get a feel of who you are, it becomes a relationship-based referral as opposed to just transactional. Yeah, that's great. And we'll post that in our show notes and we'll definitely do that. And can people reach out and connect with you? Absolutely. Yeah, I would love it. Love it. That's my goal, right? So in this environment of of inclusivity and understanding biases from the corporate level where I work with corporate clients to create these trainings and these onboarding guides and make everyone feel safe. I'm also working directly with SDRs, BDRs, full cycle account executives, and those who are trying to get into these spaces or into these roles to give them the groundwork and give them the tools that they need to be prepared for what they're going into. I'm packing it in on, on both ends to hopefully yeah. be able to change or improve our, our work environments. Oh, that's fantastic. It's been so great to hear more about what you're working on. And I wish you continued success. And I know I'll see you next year at CIS. Kayvana Parker, KP as she's known, of KPA. And thank you so much for your time today. Of course. Thank you for having me.